Okay, good afternoon. Welcome to our faculty development workshop on writing and faculty life. This is part of our first, and we're calling it the first annual, even though you're not supposed to until you actually have a, <laughs> another year under your belt, but uh, uh, UIS Authors Festival uh, at the library, uh, Women's Library, Patty Kuchowski in the library is co-sponsoring along with myself, so thank you, Patty. Uh, there's two events today as part of that festival. We're featuring faculty, authors, faculty published books. And so today we have a faculty panel talking about their writing and book publishing experience. Then later this afternoon at 4 o'clock in the Brookings Library, the new classroom, uh, we'll have a uh, ceremony uh, highlighting four of our faculty authors. Uh, there'll be reception with food and also books available for signing. And we'll recognize a couple of the names are the same uh, as we have with us here now. So uh, I want to introduce uh, our speakers. So we have uh, Dr. Peter Wentz. Uh, he got his PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He's an emeritus professor of philosophy, also a university scholar here at UIS. And I want to add that all I invited all the panelists because they're old friends, not reflecting on their age, but I've been here a long time. So uh, Peter and I have co-taught uh, back in the past, and his most recent book is on functional inefficiency. Uh, Ali Nazimuddin, PhD from Columbia. He's an associate professor of political science, and he and I have also co-taught on a science and religion class. And his latest book is The Patenting of Life. Uh, hopefully, we will also have with us uh, Dr. Larry Shiner, who has two PhDs, both from the University of Strasbourg, and uh, he's an emeritus professor of visual arts. I incorrectly said music on the program because he's a very big supporter of music. And when I first came here, he was the first teacher of music appreciation for UIS. So um, he's definitely involved in the arts. His uh, seminal book is The Invention of Art, which has been translated and published. So we also have with us, from the library, uh, Steve McMinn, who's the Director of Collections and Scholarly Communications. And uh, he's also a co-taught class with me in science writing, and he can answer all your questions about impact factors when you're working on your reviews and portfolios. So um, they're also, he also prepared a couple handouts on the back of the sign-in table, so be sure to pick those up. OK, thanks, uh, Peter. Sure. I guess I, I, I take it that I, I need to stand here so that the camera will catch me? Is right. that, is that yeah. the end? Okay. okay. Otherwise, I'd walk around. Uh, well, I'm Peter Wenz. Uh, I have uh, published eight books since I got here in Springfield in 1976. And, um, and from State University of New York Press, and one from Oxford, and a couple from Temple, and a couple from MIT, and my most recent, the one that will be in the festival, is from Prometheus uh, Press. Uh, the, uh, and, and McGraw-Hill textbook. One of the things that we're asked to, to uh, mention is the time. How do you get time to write a book? Uh, I was very lucky in that uh, when I started doing this, especially in the late 70s, uh, I could write articles on a joint appointment before I got to books. That is, there were um, public affairs um, units within the university, then Simon the State University, uh, which afforded people a release time from teaching uh, to, to do scholarly work. And I was just kind of sitting at the table when people said, gee whiz, we can't get Colin Davis because he's already going to be researching for that unit. And, but we'd like to have somebody in the humanities, and I'm a philosopher, so I said, well, I could do that. And, oh, yeah, okay. And, and then the next year they said, would you like that to be permanent? Duh. <laughs> so I ended up uh, teaching in most of my career two classes instead of three. And so that, that was very instrumental, although I did teach usually two classes in summer school as well, so I didn't have the, the summer off, and that was a, a, a financial thing. Um, and most of my uh, scholarship I did uh, at home, 
and even emeritus professors sometimes come in because they, they work in a university environment, I work in a home environment, whatever works for you. Another thing I think um, is helpful is being particularly interested in what you're writing. You might say, well, of course I'm going to be interested in what I'm writing. Well, some writing is trying to fit into what's a hot topic. Well, that's fine if you're excited by that topic. But if you're not, you're just going to have a harder time finding the time to do it. So I, I am a believer in go for your dream. Write about what you're interested in. What you're interested in in your field is going to be something that other people are interested in. This is a, a, now when it comes to writing, it, this is probably what I'm about to say applies more to articles than to books, but it applies to books as well. Writing for an academic audience is joining a conversation. You are trying to make a contribution to that field of thought. People won't take your contribution seriously unless you show some evidence that you know what other people have said about it, the, the prominent people. So you're joining a conversation that you just could imagine in a social situation. If you come up and you, you're joining a conversation, you have to hear what the other people are, have said somewhat before they are going to want to know your contribution because your contribution might be otherwise redundant and unhelpful and boring to them. So, but when it comes to a book, then you've got a divide. Well, a few divides. Most people want to write, at least in my field, I'm philosophy, and uh, I, I do sort of public philosophy. I do ethics and uh, medical ethics and environmental ethics and moral issues in the law. And uh, so I have a, a book about abortion, for example, um, and, and a couple about environmental ethics and, and economics. My most recent book is really about economics. So I've just sort of followed my interests around and, and those interests have been guided partly by what was in the news and in large part by what I happened to be teaching. I had the advantage of when I was here of being able to teach pretty much what I wanted. We were a department of three and at the time we did not have a major so that there weren't things that we actually had to cover. That's why Larry Shiner, who I hope will be here while his uh, He's in art, and he's in philosophy, he's in, he's in lots of things, um, he's an inspiration, uh, and he's working on a book, and he's older than me. Ah, here he is. Not, not, not looking as old as he should, but, but still, <laughs> he's older than me. And um, so the, the idea that in the book is also if you are writing for an academic audience, it's more like writing an article in that you have to show that you are familiar with the literature. You're, you're taking some other people on and carrying it further. Or there's a debate here and some people have missed some points on this side and on that side and you have a, a, a contribution. In an academic audience, no, no offense to us academics, but we are necessarily politically, but uh, in our discipline, somewhat conservative. An idea that is really, really new. Yeah, and then people aren't so interested. Um, <laughs> I, I found with my most recent book, which isn't aimed at an academic audience itself, the academic said, what do you mean inefficiency works in, in our economy? That's the, you know, totally right. It doesn't matter that, that I you know, have facts and figures about that. So, um, so when you're writing, whether it's an article or a book for an academic audience, you are making an incremental advance, probably, rather than trying to spur a revolution. If you're writing for a, a, a general audience, then you, you can be, if the idea turns out to be outrageous, well, that's okay if it's well supported. That may change which publisher you're, you're looking at. And um, by the way, you don't make a lot of money either way. Uh, unless you turn out to be, you know, to rolling or something like that. I mean, you're still writing um, in uh, 
for people who are interested in nonfiction. Uh, so your audience is somewhat limited. And also, the publishing industry has changed over the last 30 years with the digitization and the availability of getting books online, reading them as e-books, um, and, and Amazon, uh, which started out with books, as some of you may know, uh, has brought the price down of books. And that reduces uh, what anybody can make. So, so this, none of this is about money. It, it's about getting your ideas out there and, and uh, possibly enjoying the process of writing. Another big help. So, so you're, if you happen to be writing a book for the general public, please, camera, excuse me a minute. In fact, whoever you're writing for, it might be helpful to get the writer's market. This has a whole bunch of publishers, more publishers than you can shake a stick at, and somewhat what, what fields they are interested in, the names of the, uh, the editors there. If it's a big publisher, there'll be different editors for different uh, kinds of books, and uh, that will include um, trade, trade books, which is for the general public, as well as more specialized academic books. Now, this is an old one. Uh, you need to get a, a new one. It also has a section for agents. Um, so the, the last book that I published, I went through an agent and managed to get a publisher uh, for whom I didn't need an agent. But, you know, so she got 15% of very little, and I, she didn't complain, so uh, what's not to like? Um, when you're writing, uh, approaching the publishers, it's good to, um, you, you need a prospectus. And the prospectus traditionally has been the, the equivalent of, we should be sending this out electronically, but if I can talk about actually pieces of paper, uh, about four pieces of paper on one side, <clears throat> single space. And in that, uh, you have to give a, a very short introduction of, uh, about what this topic is and why it's important that people read what you have to say about it. In the uh, then, after that part, if you need to have some history of the topic, um, what others have said about the topic, how what you're saying is different from what other people have said, whether it's for the general public or for academic, and uh, who, who would want to read this book? What is the audience for this book? Are you writing to other professors? Are you writing for their students? Something that would be used in a class? Not necessarily as the single textbook of, of 800 pages that has soup to nuts about whatever it is, although you can write that kind of book too. Um, I, a couple of my books have been, are used in classes, but but I was really going for a general audience, and I thought that if you want the students to read something, you should actually try to make it a little engaging. Uh, so, I, so I'm not averse to engaging. Some people on the first book, by the way, that I wrote, um, you know, I had no background. It virtually was uh, published by um, State University of New York Press. But when I sent it to, to Wisconsin, my alma mater, the, the critique was, well, this could be read by a high school student. So, which surprised me as a critique. Um, it's bad if it's easy to read. Uh, no, I don't think this is bad, but uh, you limit yourself if it's, not, if it's not easy to read for the people for whom it is intended. Uh, it might be impossible for some other people. But it was a new field, and therefore I was introducing people to it, whether they were in high school or had PhDs. And um, and so you have your market and how you are appealing to that group of people in such a way that adds something that others have not yet come up with. Or you're doing it in a more engaging way so that the subject has been covered but it hasn't been covered to appeal to this audience. And, and, and that's what you're going to do. Well, my 10 minutes are up. So... Uh, I'll still be around, and I'll be around after the thing, in case anybody wants to ask or talk. Thanks, sir. Thank you. <laughs> I'll get there.
Am I here? <laughs> okay. I'm yeah. Here. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you for coming, and especially to Keenan for extending the invitation. Uh, I remember distinctly the first time uh, that I spoke at his uh, class, the Science and Religion course, he asked me to speak on issues of perceptions and misperceptions that people have of other cultures. So what did I do? I went into classes, nobody knew me. I went with a thick Indian accent. How's everybody doing today? I would like to tell you. Uh, I, uh, my, my dad came from this country just yesterday. He was uh, he now runs a 7-Eleven or mm. Dunkin' Donuts or something like that. Mm. Um, and then I proceeded to speak in normal English and I said, you just assume that I could I spoke that way and you just assume that you know my dad runs a Dunkin' Donuts or something like that. Um, and in the, the that, that was fun. That was fun. But uh, there's a uh, well, we were dealing with misperception, misperception. So, um, there was a great scholar whose name was Al Ghazali in the 10th century, and uh, he wrote 70 books. But one day, uh, this was in Baghdad, in the Darul Hikmah, which was the House of Wisdom uh, in Baghdad. And so, one day, uh, a bunch of thieves came in and began to steal all of his possessions including his books. So he said, no, please don't take everything, but let me keep my books, because my entire knowledge is in those books. And then that thug, or that marauder, the, the thief, said, knowledge is not knowledge if the likes of me can steal from you. Knowledge is something that is internal. It, it carries you wherever you go. Uh, and then, so he decides to write many, many more books after that, but this time, he decides to memorize all of his books. Um, so that knowledge is actually something that guides us wherever we go. It is the internal compass that guides us. Uh, because historically, we've had uh, cultures that were oral cultures. The transmission of knowledge was through oral means. But then there's a textual tradition that we have, where the written word is considered sacred. Uh, because it is something that distinguishes us from, uh, from lower creatures. Uh, in the discipline of political science, we have four subfields. We have the subfield of international relations, comparative politics, political theory, and American government. And within each, there are subfields. At least in IR, in international relations, we are trying to determine causation or delineate cause. Uh, you could do this at the individual level of analysis. You could do it at the domestic level of analysis or the international level or at the systemic level. And when you begin to write, you're trying to identify a research question, a puzzle, or some sort of a gap within the literature, either a gap within theory or within policy. And then, but the only way to identify or to address this gap within the literature or the research question is to come up with some sort of a literature review. And that is a scholarly assessment or the scholarly debate of what exists out there. And once you have the scholarly debate, you try to couch the explanations into categories. So there are institutional-based explanations, there are the interest-based explanations, there are the ideational ones, uh, economic explanations, whatever those explanations or categories happen to be. Once you identify those categories, then you can identify the gap that exists within the literature and you try to ask a question as to how that gap can be addressed. And I've always been taught that you want to ask a why question or a how question, not a who, who what, where question. And one of my teachers taught me that uh, those who can answer who, what, where, and when will have a job, but those who can answer why and how will be their boss. Uh, and so you're trying to answer a why question. Despite economic interdependence in World War I, why did war occur? Uh, despite economic liberalization of India and China roughly at the same time, why has investments in China exceeded, foreign direct investment in China exceeded the ones in India, for instance? Or, or despite multi multinational activity, why has there been economic underdevelopment in a certain country? So you're trying to answer the why question. And you use writing to answer that why, because you need to solve this puzzle. You need to solve this problem. 
So you used writing as a way to uh, answer something, a question that you have posed. Uh, and then, after that, you try to identify country comparisons or country cases. It's important to identify similar countries. So we're not going to compare the economic development trajectory of, say, China and Mozambique, or um, South Korea and Guinea-Bissau. Rather, you want to choose similar cases, Japan and South Korea, Singapore and Taiwan, for instance, or China and India. Uh, and each one of the country comparisons is in itself a chapter. If you try to hurdle a mountain, you won't be able to do it. It's just too much. So you try to break the book into six or seven parts. The country cases serve as the various chapters. You have the theoretical chapter or the conceptual chapter. And of course, you have the introduction and conclusions. Uh, and so sometimes and oftentimes, the country comparisons take a long time because you have to travel to that country. You have to travel to the country, a lot of the times you have to travel to the country and do research in that country. That might take some time. But then you just have to treat the country cases as individual chapters. That, and you set a quota for yourself that these two chapters have to be done over this summer. And then you write the, I always have written the introduction and conclusion last. The introduction and conclusion always have to be written last. And really, I write the conclusion first and then the introduction very, very, very last because I need the material from the conclusion to write the introduction. <laughs> because the conclusion happens, has the uh, implications for further research or its significance. Why this topic is so significant for theory and policy. That the introduction contains uh, a basic roadmap to the book. It contains the plan of the book, but the conclusion is the destination. And I need some material from the destination to get to the roadmap as well, or to include it in the roadmap. So then we choose the title from the introduction and conclusion, because the introduction and conclusion contain a snapshot. They contain a snapshot. And I use the introduction and the conclusion to come up with a title. So re the reason is because the title is something that people will remember most. It is the snapshot of the snapshot. And so the epiphany for me was once uh, when, I was, when I had gone to India to visit family, uh, I just was visiting villages. And then it was extraordinary to see the level of certain corporations in India and the impact that they were having on traditional societies. But what was even more disturbing was the number of farmer suicides that were taking place in India. And that was my epiphany. That was my moment of clarity. That was my purpose. That was my mission. I had to write something for these farmers that have taken their own life using the same pesticides that were sold to them by the corporation, especially Monsanto. So over the past 20 years, 300,000 farmers have committed suicide. Now when a farmer commits suicide, it's not just a farmer, but rather that farmer is the source of livelihood for his family or for the community. So 300,000 farmers that have committed suicide, uh, there's an entire chapter devoted to farmer suicides in, in my book, in the India chapter, uh, that's a lot of people. And I felt as though I was trying to write for them, expressing uh, what they must have gone through as a result of indebtedness. So the title that I con contemplated, because it was on the patenting of life, how life form is being patented, basically the seed, which is again considered to be sacred in traditional society, how the corporation monopolizes and has a patent over the seed. Uh, so the title that I ultimately came up with the patenting of life, limiting liberty, and the corporate pursuit of seeds. It was a play on words of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But then I thought, I think this title is just too long. And I was thinking <laughs> of other titles like Seed Incorporated. I thought that was a cool title. Or Seed Wars was another title that I thought of. And then I even thought of Corporate Hunger Games or something like that. <laughs> something stupid. Uh, but. Uh, 
I ultimately settled. I submitted to the uh, to the publisher, and they liked patenting of life, limited liberty in the corporate pursuit of seeds, which is what we went with. Um, I have found that it is very difficult to write during the academic year. It's very difficult. So what I do is that I, I gather as much material as possible over the course of the academic year. And, and I write. And I put a quote up on myself in the summer to write 500 words a day. I, this, I'm just working on a book uh, entitled The Politics of Fear. Uh, and I like setting these quotas or, or uh, just requirements upon myself. Now, if you set too high of a requirement, I have to write 2,000 pages or 2,000 words a day, you're not going to do it, and you're going to be despondent afterwards, uh, or even 1,000 words a day. Sometimes it may take an entire day to write those 500 words because you have to gather all the information. So 500 word quota has worked for me. And now you think that 500 words is a day is not that much, but 500 words a day, 10 days, that's 5,000 words. And in the course of a month, that's 15,000 words. That's almost a chapter. Uh, and so that has worked for, uh, for me. Um, and I guess the one final thing, although there are many, many people much, much, much more qualified to speak on this topic than me, uh, uh, perhaps I have a little bit of a unique insight. Uh, the way that I read due to my vision is that uh, I have a work-study student that helps me get, gather the articles and so forth. But then I have a screen reader and a screen enlarger and a Kurzweil reading machine. And so what I do is that I have to first scan the book, it gets transferred to the computer, and I hit a button and I read. And I've been doing this for almost all my life. So I'm, I've gotten really good at it. Uh, so I can read at a pace that if I were to show you the way I read, you won't be able to understand a single word, but I've just gotten used to it. It, it is at a very, very high speed. So we were required in grad school to read a, a book a day, especially when we were studying for the qualifying exam. So I locked myself in an apartment building in New York City and studied for that qualifying exam for one year. My colleagues, my friends, were reading two books a day. I don't know how they did it, but then they did it. And it only takes about eight, nine hours to read a book. But then they were devoting, it took me a little bit longer to read a book. So I, we had to read a book a day. Um, so this is the way that I read, this is the way I do research, and of course I write. Um, you, you know, uh, if there's a mistake, my work study student catches the mistake. Uh, my point in sharing with you this, this laborious way in which I work is to show you that I have uh, one thousand of the sight of most people in this room. Very, very limited sight. And yet, if I can write a book, then everybody else can. Anyway, so, thank you. Thank you. How many of you are in the middle of writing a book? Then? Okay, you're kind of, <laughs> sort of getting there, okay. So, uh, all right. Uh, several topics that Tina had suggest. One was the uh, finding the topic and finding the time. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, nobody on their deathbed has ever said, I'm going to miss those meetings. <laughs> <laughs> There's always things that we can cut out. And, uh, you have to make time. And one way of making time in an institution where we're committed to teaching, as I'm sure each of you is, is find a topic that connects to your teaching. It's something that's going to help you work on it, and it's something that'll enrich what you're teaching. Uh, I can say because I know of these books that most of Peter's books were written that way. All of mine were. Uh, they started as something to prepare for a class. So that's one thought. Then finding uh, uh, on the working methods, you've heard some really good advice already. Uh, I would 
reinforce the idea of finding a regular place at a regular time. And often, that, for me, it needed to be a separate place. Not the place you prepare your class, not the place uh, that you do some other family activities and so on. It's nice if it serves coffee or <laughs> something to eat. Um, and you begin to associate being in that place with thinking about your book, working on your book. Uh, whereas if you're in, the pl in those other places where you do other things, it just <laughs> pushes it. Those things push their way in. Okay. Then, uh, working methods. You've heard something about that. I'm going to give you a kind of a dumb analogy, but uh, you've all had classes where you studied the First World War. Everybody knows about trench warfare. Some people approach their writing in a sense that's a little like trench warfare. Right? There's the thing over there, we've got to hammer it, hammer it, hammer it until we break through. Uh, that, what I would say, is the method whereby uh, you try to get everything so precise. I'm not, uh, I'm sloppy, I don't have to admit it. I don't take it good notes. I don't write all the references out carefully. I'm now finishing up a book in which I'm spending weeks <laughs> finding those page numbers, uh, those publishers, those other little things I left by the wayside. And so maybe it would have been better if I had a little more of that Deutsch uh, <laughs> sense of <laughs> where we're going to drive ahead. But to keep on the German analogy, the best method I've discovered and I worked on and used it getting to this book is what I call Blitzkrieg. You drive your tanks through the lines, you aim for the goal constantly. And you don't worry about these pockets of resistance that are all around you. All those little problems, all those objections that you know are going to be raised, forget them. Your goal is to get a draft that will lead to an outline of the whole thing. Because believe me, if, if you don't, what's likely to happen is that you'll spend all of this time solving the problems of chapter two or three, only to conclude at the end that you're going to uh, that's six minutes worth. I'll conclude very quickly. I'm going to find the publisher, Peter, I think, covered that very well. But uh, this is really dumb, but just look at who, which publishers publish in your field. You know, whose imprint is on the books by the people you admire and that uh, you have high regard for. They'll be interested in you. Uh, and the second thing, of course, is find an elder statesperson, someone who uh, is accomplished, that you know well enough to say, give me some advice, who should I seek? And hopefully, they will name a couple of publishers, and they may even say, and when you write to Peter Owen at Oxford, mm -hmm. use my name. Uh, I'm not sure Peter Owen is really bowled over by a name dropping, but it makes you feel better. <laughs> <laughs> like somebody made the attention. Good luck. <laughs> well, I'm probably going to be the least entertaining. I don't <laughs> actually, have, actually haven't written a book. Uh, but yeah, I found the, the conversation fascinating, and I'm not going to spend too much time because I have a couple questions I want to ask. So uh, basically, I'm here as the Director of Scholarly Communications uh, with the uh, Brookings Library, and I'm basically here to say I'm here to help. Um, you know, copyright is tricky. It's good and bad for you. First of all, as a faculty author, 
what you write, you own, at least until you decide not to own it anymore. <laughs> and so that's the really good thing about it. The, uh, you know, it gets tricky in a lot of ways. That's kind of why I did the balancing act on my handout. It's, you know, it's even like the same with publishing articles. You have this balance. It's like, how much do I want to get published versus how much do I want to keep? How much what am I willing to give up? How much am I willing to risk? Yeah, you know, a lot of it is risk analysis. It's like, you know, this publisher won't let me keep my rights to use my work later in the classroom or won't let me keep my rights to use a chapter out of this book or, or a chart or something else out of this book in a supplemental work or in a future work. So there are those kind of trade-offs that you have to make. You know, you have to decide personally as an author what kind of trade-offs are you willing to make. Are you, you know, is this something where you know, you worked in the summer because it was a monetary thing. You know, if you really need to get published because that's what's going to get you tenure, then you might not care whether you have to give up the fact that you can lay, use your work at a later time and those types of things. So it is really a balancing act. The nice thing about being at UIS is the administration basically says that you own what you write, unless it's a work for hire. Some universities, like the University of Michigan, has that they co-own everything that you own and they give your copyrights back to you, uh, which is kind of an interesting way to do it. But uh, So there is lots of information in the statutes, and that's on my handout, uh, if you want to see what all the policies are and those types of things. Uh, but essentially, copyright is a deal that the government, a long time ago, made with people who create intellectual property. And the, trade, the deal was, we will protect your rights for so many years, and copyrights is really a long time. It's the life of the author now plus 70 years. And in exchange for us protecting your rights, then we have the right to, you have the right to distribute it and, and be protected and want to share it out with the world. And so that's kind of, you know, um, when the one person was talking about, uh, uh, talking about, uh, uh, it's a conversation. You know, I come from the sciences, and our big standing, or our big saying in the sciences is standing on the shoulder of giants. And it's that bibliography of where you've read other people's work and you understand that, and then you're adding to that conversation, and then hopefully people will then be citing you later and adding to that conversation. So it's really, uh, it's really a nice trade-off in the fact that it builds a body of work that people can share and use, and then further share ideas and create new ideas and those types of things. So. Um, what, it's also a trade-off in what your publisher wants. Um, you know, as your work, you may want to include an image or a chart or a, um, a psychological test or something that someone else has, owns a copyright on. And how much you can use of that and whether you have to get permission and those types of things may also depend on your publisher. Some publishers are very strict and say, yes, I need you to either you know, license this or pay for permission or you can't include it. Some publishers uh, take a, I don't want to say more lax view, a more open view to say there are exceptions in the copyright for fair use and for, and in terms of attribution and those types of things. So, you know, I, I can't really come up here and say there's one copyright answer, because it really depends on the conversation you have between yourself and your publisher and those types of things. But the important thing is for you to know your rights uh, we have some very good pages on the library website that talks about what rights you have under copyright. And also, if you want to protect some of those rights, there are things that you can add to the contracts that you sign with your publisher called author addendums uh, that will specify that say, I want to be able to reuse this part of this work in my class because I, I will help enhance my teaching and it's something I want to be able to share with my students without having to worry about having to, having given away the copyright rights to distribute that. So, uh, that's really all I have to say. I just wanted to uh, let you know that, that I, as the copyright person, I'm here to help. I'm, if you're thinking about writing something and want to do an author addendum, either for an article or a book, or if you just have questions about copyright, open access, creative commons licensing, those types of things, uh, that's what we do. So, thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks to all the speakers. Oh, one other thing. We do have the Writer's Marketplace in the library. The most recent edition is our reference collection, and there's a circulating copy upstairs on the fourth floor.